So thanks so much to Shona for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm very sorry that she's unwell today and not here to, to hear. Um, it's timely, this talk, because I'm contemplating a trip to Ireland later this year, during which I, I plan to prod my publisher, Four Courts Press, into a second edition of, of uh, Defending Trinity College Dublin. And um, so I'd better say nice things about them, as this is going to be on... Uh, uh, on um, YouTube. And I'd like to also thank the Embassy of Ireland in Wellington and the former ambassador, Peter Ryan in particular, for believing in my project and coming to uh, its aid at a crucial stage of publication. Um, also a belated tribute to my editor, Dr. Austin G., uh, whose splendid work in making my manuscript intelligible, uh, I usually fail to acknowledge and to compliment. So. I've launched the book a few times now, but the only speech notes I could unearth this week were those given either in Ireland or to an Irish audience. So people with an extensive, if not always accurate knowledge of the events of 1916. So I'll begin with a brief account of, of what happened in Easter week, then explain how my book fits in, why I wrote it, and briefly how it was received. So it tells the story of how five Kiwi soldiers and medical orderlies led a successful defense of Ireland's oldest university, saving it from rebel occupation and almost certain destruction. It answers the, the provost of Trinity, the, the chief officer of the college's Pat Prendergast's call for, quote, glimpses of alternative viewpoints that may serve to illuminate our preconceived ideas about the rising. And I think he possibly got more than he bargained for on that score, but we might cover that one in questions. Um, then I'll talk to, through some illustrations that help to uh, tell the story, all of which are in the book and hopefully leave plenty of time for questions. So what was the Easter rising, the rebellion, the insurrection? A week-long uh, uh, rebellion, almost entirely in Dublin, staged in the middle of World War I, the Great War, by around a thousand radical Irish nationalists who rejected the gradualist constitutional path to a form of Irish self-government um, under the empire, uh, known popularly as home rule. Instead, these men and women declared war on England with the aid of what the, their proclamation of the Irish Republic called our gallant allies in Europe. And of course, that was Germany, Austro-Hungary, and as I used to get my students to eventually realize, Turkey. So you can imagine how that went down exactly on the exact anniversary of the, uh, the, land, the Anzac landings. Um, the result? Well, not what um, the, the sort of pinup boy or the, the leading spokesman of the rising uh, P Patrick Pierce, Porrick McFerrish, uh, hoped for, which was a rallying to the rebel flag by hitherto deluded Irish men and women, as David Fitzpatrick puts it, flinging off their English vestments. Um, instead, a, 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 a dreadful toll of over 3,000 dead were seriously wounded, mostly civilians, mostly Irish. In fact, nearly all of the military units, the police and the civilians were Irish. And uh, historians, Irish historians have been disappointingly slow to acknowledge the degree to which Easter week began a civil conflict in Ireland. It's uh, the, 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 the sort of cartoon version has it that the moment the first shot was fired from the GPO, everyone in khaki was somehow British and the Irish were in the rebel strongholds fighting them. Um, so uh, uh, the, within a week, the British authorities had regained control using artillery, as we'll discover, to subdue the central rebel stronghold, the GPO, the General Post Office, and shooting 14 leaders of the rebellion after fairly summary trials. And, and this act, that act, and the corrosive effect of British post-rising policy in Ireland over the next couple of years, incompetent, erratic, 
often brutal, always self-defeating, meant that while the rebels lost the battle, they fairly rapidly won the war. Um, the rising survivors adopted the derisory title Sinn Féin, which would, had been used in a mocking reference to the rebels, a, a small, rather irrelevant cultural group of nationalists. Um, and under that reinvented Sinn Féin uh, title, they um, won a form of independence. Uh, they swept the 1918 general election and they won a form of independence for 26 of Ireland's 32 counties after a fairly sordid conflict from 1919 to 21, known variously as the Troubles or the Irish War of Independence. So that's the rising in a nutshell. How, how does defending Trinity College Dublin fit into this picture? Well, I think first you need to recognize the centrality of 1916, the, if you like, the fact and the fiction of the rising to Irish popular consciousness. Everything has been uh, wrongly, I believe, seen beforehand as leading up to the rising. Everything subsequent was seen as stemming from the rising. Um, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to convey um, the significance uh, of the rising in Ireland. Almost any Irish citizen could stand here and talk for an hour on it. Um, and uh, expand on what I'm saying. In New Zealand terms, I would say, think of combining Ed Hillary's climbing Everest, uh, New Zealand giving women the vote in 1893, all the America's Cup and all black teams that ever played. And of course, we, we have to include the fabulous Black Ferns with five world titles. 1916 is bigger than all of those in the Irish national consciousness. So historians need to be very careful if they dare to tread on such sacred ground, especially um, uh, foreign ones like me, because I know there's a rumor floating around somehow that I was, I'm from Manchester, but in fact, I was born in the Bog of Ireland and uh, Bog of Allen, and I um, am, uh, uh, a, a fairly uh, patriotic Irishman. So, but heedless of the danger, like some brash colonial cousin uh, crashing the party, my book presents a challenge to the current orthodoxy over the rising. Firstly, by effectively proving that that Trinity College Dublin here, that walled fortress in the center of the city was subjected to a fierce rebel attack on the morning of the 25th of April. And secondly, by giving as much attention to the 14 colonial troops who saved it from rebel occupation, as most Irish historians pay to the 14 rebel leaders who were executed in the immediate aftermath of the rising. These men were chased, well, the men, I say, uh, let's describe them. They were five Kiwis, one Aussie, six South Africans, two Canadians. They were chased into college by rebel gunfire. They organized and led the defense of the college. And I argue that without their intervention, Trinity guarded by only by aged porters armed with, with pikes would have fallen. And then nothing less than heavy and prolonged shell fire would have sufficed to defeat the occupiers. And there was a good chance that Trinity would have ended Easter week in a heap of smoking rubble. So I developed this rather provocative line in chapter five. I'll explain why my, I, I've chosen to, to um, adopt that line when I discuss the historiography. Um, the early chapters are devoted to explaining why the entire episode has been missed by Irish historians over the past century. That, to be honest, that had me stumped for quite some time. Um, and the degree of, let's call it discomfiture, felt by Trinity College Dublin at its part in the events of Easter week. And that's the, the element here, that, that the dimension that interests me most, the historiographical one. And my friend Thomas Chatovitz has uh, volunteered a German phrase, which might sum up uh, TCD's attitude over the last century. 
Todgeschwiegen, apologies for the pronunciation to Nicole, um, death by not mentioning. Um, it's, um, or as Basil Fawlty might put it, don't mention the war. So in 1916, Trinity was an unashamed bastion of, of Britishness, of Protestantism, um, of unionism. What uh, Douglas Hyde, uh, later president of Ireland, called that English fort in Ireland. Uh, or as in the words of one rebel marching past front gate on his way to St. Stephen's Green, the intellectual center of West Britainism. So, sure, it was empty on Bank Holiday Monday, the 24th of April, when the rebellion began. And as I argue, for the next two days, the Anzacs held the defense. But by the end of Easter week, some 16,000 troops were quartered there. So, in short, Trinity was the center from which the rising was crushed. There really is no getting away from that. But I, I look in vain for a balanced appraisal of its role in 1916 from uh, anything produced by the college. Three official histories uh, written since 1922, eight pages out of over 1,000 only uh, deal with Trinity and the Rising. And running through those works is a sense, as, as former Vice Provost Arthur Luce, who helped to defend the college, put it in 1967, that Trinity had backed the wrong horse in uh, uh, the crucial uh, moment. So 50 years later, in 1966, the pendulum had swung a long way. By then, Provost uh, Albert McConnell had a framed copy of the Irish Proclamation uh, the proclamation of the Irish Republic on the walls of his study and said he he knew the contents almost by heart uh, while as part of the celebrations a 21 gun salute was fired from the grounds of Trinity not against the rebels as in 1916 but in their honor so 50 years on in 2016 a ceremony was held outside Trinity's front gate and a plaque erected uh, across the road to mark the college's actions in the rising. But this event was to commemorate a rebel victim of the Anzacs. There was nothing said or done to, to mark the actions of the defenders themselves. And this is something I was hoping to uh, help to redress um, after the publication of the book, but COVID intervened. So very much COVID has tripped my, uh, my, my plans up uh, quite significantly. But uh, anyway, to get back to the historiography, Trinity commissioned two historical publications, and it was these that sparked me into action. And what became a critical review, uh, uh, then a lengthy article, has ended up as a 60,000 word monograph. And you, if you're if you possess $40 or access to such, you can get a signed copy today and um, you can um, develop some of the, the themes that I'm just touching on in, a, in my brief talk today. But before I discuss the two Trinity College books, um, I must mention Jeff Kilday's Anzacs in Ireland, which I unaccountably have forgotten to bring with me, but is in the public library here. It's a book, University of New South Wales Press, 2007. And those three books are the only publications to mention the college's colonial defenders in the several hundred books on the Easter Rising. It's, it's an avalanche of publication. And they either, the, the, the Anzacs are either entirely overlooked or dismissed as in one account, quote, a number of scared British soldiers uh, sheltering behind Trinity's solid walls. Confusion reigned then and more recently as to their identity. They're usually referred to as colonials, sometimes Anzacs, more, most often Australians and both Crown and Rebel camps made this blunder of identification. Five of the six Anzacs, as I've said, were Kiwis, um, but the inability of the Irish ear to identify their distinctive accent has led some observers on a wild kangaroo chase for an Aussie contingent among the Crown forces, notably uh, Tim Pat Coogan, if anyone remembers that fellow's passage here 30 years ago when he uh, 
be left with free copies of the books of most of um, my colleagues and myself. But um, Kilday's pioneering work, which is very good and readable, touches on the defense of Trinity, but only lightly as the sole Aussie in um, the, uh, amongst the Anzac contingent um, failed to, uh, to write any letters or diary or reminiscences of his Dublin experiences, unlike his New Zealand comrades. And Jeff also follows the, the Aussie tradition of uh, interpreting Anzac to mean merely Australian. To be fair, he was unaware of those Kiwi letters home and he admits his inability to account for their anxiousness in Dublin with what I find a disarming frankness. Uh, quote, one is left wondering what motivated them to do what they did. By contrast, Trinity's uh, production, first of all, Trinity and the Rising, uh, reveals different opinions over the impact of the Rising on college. Historian Eunan O'Halpin, who kindly wrote the introduction to my book, argues that it was a site of battle, while his colleague, Thomas Irish, flatly denies this, echoing the claims of his 2015 commissioned history, Trinity in War and Revolution. And he mentions that the deep unease felt by Trinity over its role in 1916, but he gives that tradition a novel twist by denying the necessity of uh, any such Anzac heroics as I describe in my book. According to Tomasz, there was no attack on Trinity, so no need to defend it. The defense, a word he, he uses, but keeps safely guarded in inverted commas, was not real. Uh, the, the, uh, the locking of front gate, a largely symbolic act, uh, Trinity merely a pantomime villain in the great national drama being played out on the streets of Dublin. And he says this repeatedly. At page 81, Trinity was a heartbeat away from actual fighting. Uh, the motley crew present in Trinity on Easter Monday made preparations for an attack, but none ever came. Page 99, the attacks were metaphorical rather than literal. There was little defending to be done, page 159. There was little need to defend Trinity during Easter week. The defense was largely an imagined one. Well, I don't so much criticize this, uh, this uh, approach in my introduction as laugh at it. Uh, a, a cynical reader might detect here an attempt to drag Trinity out of the British camp, if not quite as far as the GPO, then at least into the middle of Sackville Street, later O'Connell Street, Ireland's main thoroughfare. The college, as he depicts it, is confused and conflicted, overwhelmed by the speed and complexity of events, almost itself a victim of the insurrection. So, put simply, my book attempts to answer several questions left unasked in those three publications. How close did Trinity come to being a central battleground in the rising? I argue very close. How and why did it escape its grisly fate? And not least, what might have happened but for the intervention of the colonial troops? And th these are among what my, my late and lamented teacher, Professor David Fitzpatrick has called, quote, the hard questions of history what actually happened and who thought what, why, and with what consequences. So a word or two on the reception of the book in Ireland might be in order. Um, it's received a mixed response. Uh, the editor of Irish Historical Studies, Dr. Marie Coleman, deemed it to be too short at 200 pages for a review. And I, I, I replied modestly, that when someone else produced a novel interpretation of the seminal event in modern Irish history using previously unknown sources, we might well be reviewed together in Irish historical studies. By contrast, the Irish Sunday Post praised it as, quote, a superb piece of historical excavation and a reminder that even well-trodden ground can sometimes yield up new treasures. 
so gratifying, but immediately I thought that the ground was not well trodden. The vast majority of works on the rising pay scant attention to the crown, or if you like, the British side of the story. Most of them are uncritical, often frankly celebratory, uh, that's a tough word to say, focused entirely on the rebels, and written largely from their perspective, which isn't to say they're not uh, worth reading, but this is not well-trodden ground. And what I tried to do was to use the opportunity to, of a, a novel and surprising piece of, of enlightenment on the rising to, to develop some other themes that have been, let's say, neglected in the, the avalanche of um, a, a, more, a more national uh, appreciation, a more unified and celebratory approach to, to the Easter rising. Uh, so a final word on sources, which are, is the key. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to, to locate not only the correspondence, the New Zealand military records of the five Kiwi defenders of Trinity, but to speak to several of their children. And by marrying these sources with Trinity's own considerable record of its Easter week experiences and the various rebel accounts contained in Ireland's Bureau of Military History, collected in the 1930s and 40s, but embargoed and only recently in the last 10, 20 years released, witness statements, military service pension files, a much clearer picture emerged and one which I believe um, uh, overturns the, the, the prevailing historical orthodoxy that Trinity College wasn't uh, in, in historian Charles Townsend's typically measured phrase, never directly threatened during the rising. So end of the, the sort of formal talking um, and I, with a bit of luck, I'll get the uh, machinery right and be able to um, flick through some of the images, which really are um, more, they tell more of a tale in a short uh, uh, span of time. This is the Trinity in 1913. Whoops. It's a, um, it's about 35 acres. Uh, it's a mile perimeter. The key points, the key point is here, the officer training headquarters. It had 300 rifles, it had 5,000 rounds of ammunition. The rebels knew about it. The rebels took the station here, De Valera's 3rd Battalion. They marched along the railway line. The officer training corps cadets, which included for the first six hours after the rebellion broke out at midday on Monday, maybe eight hours, included the Anzacs, uh, by which I mean all of the colonial troops and a few uh, followers. And the cadets were mostly inexperienced young men. I, I uh, go into that quite deeply in the book. They could hear their calls. They could hear their tramping. They could hear the sentry calls. They could hear their conversation. And they imagined for the first terrifying 12 hours that they were about to be attacked. They were never attacked by the, all the action was up at the front of the college. This is where uh, the, um, the rebel units were assembling and moving. When we get to a later map, we'll see how central Trinity was. It, 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 it was a stride rebel communication lines. By about midnight, or, or in fact, probably by late evening, the Anzacs had persuaded their military leaders, uh, professors of English and classics res uh, respectively, that they really should be defending the college, which is here, the front square, and not cowering on the second floor of this building waiting to be attacked. So eventually in the wee hours of the morning, all of the rifles and ammo was transferred to this square here where I lived for uh, a year in my second year at college. And the Anzacs volunteered to man the windows and roof of this is this building, which we'll see later in the, 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 the slides. 
the, the, the main building. Across the road, the Bank of Ireland, down the road, Sackville Street and G the GPO, um, Dublin Castle further. So basically this is, tr tr it's, it's indefensible really. What you had to do was what they eventually realized they did, which was corral themselves into this area here and uh, shoot at everything that moved. And here of course is the, the library, um, no, there's the library, which had the priceless treasures of, of the Book of Kells and a, 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 an incendiary shell landed here in Provost Garden. So um, had the rebels taken the college, it would have been all on. The, the British, no respecter of, of Irish sensibilities. And as Charles Townsend said, there was a sort of weird atmosphere of militarism in the ascendant. They'd lost a hundred plus troops to rebel ambush. They made a decision early on. Any building from which rebel fire had emanated was to be destroyed. And they managed to destroy with the aid of fire and some rebel um, stupidity, um, 200 buildings. So when I gave a talk in 2017 at Trinity, before I'd written the book, but I had done some research and I suggested that Trinity could end Easter week in a heap of smoking rubble. I got dissent, let's say, from the audience of Don's, uh, unthinkable. But none of the owners and occupiers of the 200 buildings that were standing on Easter Monday and weren't standing a week later had any conception that their building might be destroyed. Trinity is no... Uh, um, really had no divine sanction. Now, I've got another one coming. Oh, you can do it, good man. We're frozen in 1913. Oh, there, there it is. So um, I start the book by explaining why no one knew about this story. And immediately, the credit for the defense of Trinity was given to the officer training corps, the cadets, most of whom were wet behind the ears, 18, couldn't, couldn't hold a rifle straight, let alone fire one, that Trinity's uh, role had halved during the war. All of their experienced men were fighting. So the Anzacs, and by that I mean the five New Zealanders and the, uh, the one Aussie, the other colonial troops hadn't seen action. All of the Anzacs had seen a form of action, four of them in Gallipoli. So they knew one end of a rifle from the other and they organized the defense. And as uh, Professor Jolie, whom we'll see later, um, admitted straight away, once the soldiers, uh, once the shooting started, the soldiers took command and that meant the Anzacs. So here's General Maxwell, a, a notorious figure in, uh, uh, Irish um, nationalist historiography, the commander of the British forces, the uh, executioner of, of uh, Pierce and Connolly and his, his uh, comrades. Uh, behind him is Lady Asquith and obscured uh, is her husband, the prime minister. Uh, and this is in May, um, on the, um, this is the second function, the 5th of August. Um, uh, yeah, the 5th of August, 1916. They had three functions on Trinity's ground to honor the officer training corps um, um, lads. And there they are in the background with their rifles. This is the more formal function on um, the, uh, the 5th of August. Uh, they're the only group that are allowed to carry arms. And there's uh, Maxwell again in the center and the, the fellow in the black gown is, is, is the provost of uh, um, Mahaffey, a very um, um, famous figure. And here is uh, uh, Colonel Tate uh, or Major Tate, the head of the officer training corps, the commanding officer speaking and presenting all of those wonderful little silver cups. Tate himself got a, a cup, uh, an inscribed sword and the KBE for his performance in um, defending Trinity. Where was he? He was in the north of Ireland. He, he didn't manage to get back in time for the, to defend the college. But th that's almost a symbol of the fact that the Anzacs were, they were, 
occasional tourists in Dublin. They were there on convalescent, they were holidaying, they were caught up in the events, they played their role, then they went back to the, fight the real war and they were effectively forgotten. Although, of course, they once they heard that there were cups for those def people who defended uh, the college, they um, they wrote in and uh, and got their cup. And here's Prime Minister Asquith leaving Richmond Jail, visiting not the um, wounded uh, uh, defenders but the uh, rebels. So um, the the second function that the uh, Trinity hosted was very much to remind Asquith of who. Uh, whose side he was on and uh, um, because there was a delicate balance of, of political parties, uh, including the Irish parliamentarians, Redmond and Asquith rushed over to Dublin and was seen by the unionists as being just a little bit too keen to uh, um, sympathize with the, the, uh, the Im imprisoned rebels. Professor John Jolie, a, an amazing character, pr a professor of geology, 56 years old, who played not just a wonderful role in the defense of college, but left a, a very a vivid account of Easter week from inside Trinity. And a remarkable man, um, possibly the most remarkable fact about him is that there's a crater in Mars named after him. The man who organized the defense of the college, who listened to the Anzacs, and gave them their head. Captain Ernest Alton, a professor of classics, um, third in command of the officer training corps. The other two were no nowhere to be seen. Tubby Alton and um, a very admirable fellow who, whose two accounts of uh, the events of Easter week were, let's say, uh, reticent to the point of um, invisibility. I mean, he, he he wouldn't give any of the, the gory details uh, that uh, certainly uh, John Jolie supplied. And my favorite Anzac, if you like, um, uh, John or Jack Garland, John Goodwin Garland, a, uh, uh, the most vivid of the correspondents uh, whose letters uh, are a mixture of precise, verifiable fact and utter fantasy, um, but a wonderful fellow and sadly Rhonda Garland who gave me this photograph, um, died uh, a couple of weeks ago, his uh, great uh, uh, niece. And here's a, an idea of, of the, the Loop Line Bridge and Westland Row Railway Station, which is just out of shot on the right, and the officer training headquarters and the parade ground. Um, this is a shocking photograph to uh, an old boy of Trinity, uh, the, the college, crammed with with um, khaki and um, military equipment. This is Front Square, the Campanile, or the Campari, as it's not sometimes known. And I, oh no, I can't do that. <laughs> I've got to do this. But now I'm going to do it though. My, my room was there in second year. And that the college is exactly as it was they re they they relay the cobbles exactly the same place it's an amazing um the, the rubrics the oldest buildings at the end now no longer covered in ivy but still uh, recognizable um, british troops um uh helping themselves to the water um obviously easter week is long over now but they're still there and the the question i would get from Irish historians, to my surprise, was what the hell were those New Zealanders doing there? And the, the, the um, part of the explanation that I challenge, or the, what, what's passed for an explanation, is that they were unwilling conscripts caught up in a fight that was none of their business. And really, they, uh, they were a bit like Trinity is portrayed, confused and conflicted. Not a bit of it. I mean, there's New Zealand joining uh, the the de defence of, of 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 Belgium, scaring the Kaiser. Within ten weeks of the declaration of war, we had sent two ex not just equipped and recruited, but sent two expeditionary forces off to what became eventually Gallipoli and to uh, capture German Samoa. Now the lads, yes, three of them, K 
captured in a newsreel, unbelievably, three of the, um, the Anzacs um, from the left, McHugh, uh, no, no, McLeod, um, uh, Edward um, Waring, and uh, an unknown, and then finally the one Aussie carrying his rifle, uh, Michael McHugh. Um, and I think I've got another shot of them. Yeah, the same three lads, um, but this time wearing McLeod and McHugh. And uh, yeah, I, I, what I do in chapter four is I try to put flesh on the bones of these men and track them and how they came to be there, but how they interrelated and, and um, what they thought about and wrote about their experiences but tested them against the other source material. Wynn's Hotel, where the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, helped to plan the rising, and also where two of the Anzacs, Garland and Nevin, uh, stayed until, of course, it all caught fire and was one of the 200 destroyed buildings. So um, ironic that. And now here's a better uh, photograph. Um, this is the... Uh, the Officer Training Corps, two story headquarters. So for the first six hours of the rising, when they realized that something was going on, the, uh, the, off, the OTC leaders shifted all the ammo and the rifles from the ground floor to the upper floor. So they were sort of preparing to hold out. And they, had, they were in a sense of siege because what happened immediately the shooting started was, all the Irish soldiers rushed to the barracks, of which there were several. They knew where the barracks were to defend the barracks. The police were pulled off the streets. The rebels had a strong sense for the first 24 hours that they had won. And so did the defenders. So um, it took some persuading, and I would have loved to have had more information on it, uh, that to get the... Um, the OTC leaders to agree to shift the uh, the um, rifles to the the uh, the front square, which you can see in the distance there. So this is the main building uh, from which the uh, uh, Anzacs defended. There's the Bank of Ireland across the way, and I'll talk about the significance of that later. And it was these buildings behind the bank that the rebels occupied the rooftops and set up covering fire for a, uh, an invading party to go over the uh, railings and to take Trinity at midnight. And to their utter amazement, because Trinity had been quiescent for 12 hours, they knew it was empty, it was a bank holiday. They, as soon as they started shooting, they were met with very accurate return fire and in effect, the Anzacs and the defenders bluffed the rebels into thinking that on Monday and Tuesday, the Trinity was the armed camp that it became by Thursday. And um, that the Anzacs part in that bluff was never really um, uh, credited. The ironic thing was that because the fire came from the rooftops of the buildings at one, two, three in the morning behind the, um, uh, the Bank of Ireland, the Anzacs, to a man, believed that that was what the rebels were after. They had seen a lot of looting. They hadn't read the proclamation of the Irish Republic. They thought that these lads were trying to rob the bank, which they could possibly have had some understanding of being young, fairly rootless men themselves. And that's what they wrote home, and that's what they told everybody. That's what they told the officer training corps officers when they arrived with all the guns and ammo uh, at 3.30 in the morning, when the gun battle, the three-hour gun battle was over. And that's the version that got in the Irish newspapers when they started publishing a day or two or three later. They, come up, they came up with fanciful accounts of the rebels storming the gates of the Bank of Ireland, only to be repulsed by the gunfire from the roof of Trinity by the students. So the Anzacs get written out, but the story 
remains the Anzac story. And they all, and three of them write home, say, we defended the Bank of Ireland. We stopped the rebels from taking the bank. And um, unfortunately for them, they, um, that it was at the cost of their reputation. So Irish historians came along and saw these newspaper reports and said, well, this is absolute nonsense. And they knew it. There are no windows to the Bank of Ireland. It's defenseless as, it's useless as an outpost. It's also critically, it was the home of the independent Irish parliament. It's a sacred place to the rebels. They would no sooner destroy it and storm it and endanger it than the queen would set fire to Buckingham Palace. So Irish historians read that, dismissed it and moved on. They, so, and I've got to confess here that it took me I don't know, six months to figure it out myself. I was reading the letters and I was thinking, what's going on here? What's going on here? Then the penny dropped. So um, let's have another look here. So here you get a sense of how Trinity is really in, uh, uh, there, there's Trinity uh, here. Whoop. Um, yeah, here. And there's the, the Devil Era and the 3rd Brigade. The GPO is here down O'Connell Street here. The, the Four Courts, the, the, um, the rebels are here. So Trinity is smack bang in the center. And basically my what if -ry chapter is not um, based on, uh, the, the most horrible thought isn't so much that the rebels might have taken the college, but that the whole, the, I, I don't argue that it would have changed the outcome of the rising. I argue strongly it would have changed the course of the rising because what the British did was they bypassed all of the rebel strongholds. They ignored them. They concentrated their artillery on the general post office, which of course Patrick Pierce and his mates had, had advertised as their headquarters and they shelled the crap out of it until they surrendered and Pierce insisted on the surrender because civilians were dying. You take Trinity away from the crown, you give it to the rebels, they command the streets. The British have to storm their strongholds from the outside. The, of course they succeed, they're, they're 16 to one. They fall back on Trinity. They make their last stand at Trinity. They do not surrender they die there. That was their purpose, to make a blood sacrifice, an assertion in arms is what the proclamation called it. And so what's left of Trinity isn't worth uh, thinking about. And certainly the point is that not only it is their funeral pyre, it becomes rapidly a shrine to their memory. So no one will rebuild it. Certainly not as Trinity College Dublin. I, I uh, provocatively suggested that Pierce College Dublin might have been the, the name of the sort of future uh, edifice erected on the site of Trinity. Now, Irish historians have spent a lot of time arguing over whether or not Pierce read the proclamation of the Irish Republic from the steps of the GPO, the General Post Office, which the ruins of which are here, a photograph taken from, from um, Nelson's pillar, which sadly uh, uh, lasted only 50 more years before the IRA blew it up. Now there's definitely a step there, but I, I, I use that um, just to show the extent of the destruction and the fact that I think it took them 16 years to rebuild the, the post office, customs house the same. Um, who would have rebuilt Trinity College Dublin? Within six years, the Irish state was in the hands of men who, who revered the 1916 martyrs. It, and the, the state was in their, uh, basically in their honor. So I, I'm su suspecting that this fellow here is, is is the, the chief porter marshal who, um, uh, 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 this is post rising, but um, the, the fellow with the bowler cap is the, uh, the one who decided that um, he would uh, bar the gate, put a lock on it and issue pikes to his uh, uh, fellow porters to defend the college, which would not have ended well, but that's front gate. Uh, Marima, the, the um, 
the hospital ship that two of the Anzacs were medical orderlies on, and they uh, uh, they ha were forbidden to use arms. But what they did was, such was the the pressure of the situation and the camaraderie felt by the Anzacs that they covered over their Red Cross badges with OTC badges and they they got up on the battlements and gave as good as they got. In fact, they shot at everything that moved, something that I later uh, discuss in the book. Taking of Samoa, Gallipoli, Edward Waring, sadly, the only um, one of the Anzacs or the New Zealand Five who, who um, he left a, a, a letter of thanks to the officer training corps for his, um, his cup, uh, but he died of influenza in 1918. The rebel who died at the hands of the Anzacs, Gerald Keogh, um, who's uh, probably the only one who's really remembered now, a former pupil of St. Enders College, pa pa Patrick Pierce's college, who uh, in 1909, I say, he was a, he acted as a warrior in the, the school production of the boy deeds of Cuchulain. And um, nine years later, he got the, to play the role in real life. This is an interesting fellow, Frank Thornton. He um, born in Drogheda, but he brought over from Liverpool, where he was living, 67 volunteers and another 50 came from Bootle. Um, he also brought two of his brothers and uh, one sister, all to fight in the Easter Rising. And he was the commander of the force that was um, designated to take Trinity. And thankfully, he left a, um, a Bureau of Military History uh, statement to that effect. So uh, while I argue from lots of um, scrappy evidence and, and suggestive evidence, I, al I always knew I had that in my back pocket in case uh, a, a reviewer might have challenged, and none has. It's, I think I've, we've got a new orthodoxy now that Trinity was attacked. And getting on to families, uh, uh, there's uh, Alexander Don, uh, bottom right, uh, one of the, the more... Um, colorful of the Anzacs and his two brothers and his sister who was a nurse and they're photographed in London. So it was defending the empire and attacking the empire was a family affair. And that photograph and this one of, of Alexander Don wearing the slouch hat that saved his life, I owe to um, um, his granddaughter, Glenda, who was very kind enough to volunteer uh, them to me when um, Linda Tyler was kind enough to take me to see Glenda. And I'll, I'll just read out um, Don's letter, which I, with which I start chapter three, if I've got enough time, because it's the most vivid thing you could imagine. And I hold it back until the third chapter. On Easter Monday, I was walking past Dublin Castle and everything seemed all right when a couple of shots rang out and two Tommies who were in front of me fell over. I thought I must be dreaming and went over to where they were lying and saw that one had got it through the head and the other through the neck. Then I looked up and saw a couple of men in green uniforms and slouch hats, rifles and bandoliers regarding me from the housetops. It was my hat that saved my life because it seemed to puzzle them being so very like their own, though, of course, not green. Now, what was going on? was the Irish citizen army, which was part of the, uh, the insurrection force, had a uniform identical to the uniform that Don was wearing. They imagined that he might be one of them late for his appointment at St. Stephen's Green, round the corner where they were mobilizing. What he did was go around at the next corner, pull out his revolver, which he kept with him, and fired away at them. So they were thus removing any doubt as to whose side he was on. But on the eve of leaving for Ireland to get the book printed, to get a photograph of the man himself wearing the hat that saved his life, signed and dated 1916 was beyond serendipity. So, um, and there the cup that Corporal Don received uh, and Hugh Keane, um, friend of ours, um, found it in a market in Auckland and uh, kindly gave me photographs of it. 
as I say, all of the 136 people who were credited with saving Trinity from um, uh, capture uh, were given these little miniature cups. Now here, the last two photos, this gives you an idea of the, the size of the place. This is the front gate. The, the, um, the soldiers and the porter marshal were standing just in between the two statues of Goldsmith and Burke. And that's the traditional sort of photo of Trinity. And off there to the left, the Bank of Ireland, a massive edifice. But as I say, completely militarily useless. Um, and here a better idea. This is on Peace Day, June 1919. So uh, Westmoreland Street, completely full of people and everybody on the roof and battlements of Trinity. And you can just glimpse the portico of the Bank of Ireland. So from here, the rebel, the, the, um, the Anzacs had a superb vantage point. And so basically anyone who controlled Trinity and um, it, it was a touch and go thing, the rebels could have taken it. And I go into the reasons why they didn't. Fundamentally, it was because the 1916 rising was not national uprising. It was a conspiracy by a handful of people. And once the conspiracy was sprung, the weekend it was supposed to happen and the commanding officer of the Irish volunteers, the body that was supposed to go out in rebellion, countermanded the mobilization order. When the rebel, when the, the, the small minority of a minority decided to push on a day late, midday on Monday, they had one rebel, whereas on the Sunday they would have had five. So they couldn't carry out their initial plan of occupying Trinity. And of course, the plan and the planners, neither of them survived Easter week. So no Irish historian has been able to speak infallibly on the subject, but my earlier point stands. They haven't been interested in doing so because Basically, who, who worries about the losers? And the, um, the, the Easter rebels might have lost the battle, but they most certainly won the war. And with that, um, I think we could stop me talking and we could um, have some questions if you have any urgent ones.